Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in singing and praise. Good morning, everybody. I am Michael. I'm the associate pastor here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online. Um, you know, before, can I, can I just pray? Can we just, can I just pray for us? Um, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for being, thank you for loving the wor world so much that you sent your son for us, God. Thank you for loving us so much that we don't have to do anything, Lord, but it's by faith we are saved. Through your grace, Lord. And God, you are a God who answers. You are a God who answers when we call, God. And we just pray this morning that you would answer us as we call, Lord. Whoever is in here, whoever is hurting, whoever is weary, whoever is beaten down, that they would look to you, that they would feel the, the ease of their pains, of their struggles, Lord, that they would be lifted up by you because you are gentle and lowly in heart and your yoke is easy. Your burden is light, Lord. So bring us to you, Lord. Speak to us today. Bring us to you, Lord. Help us to rid us of ourselves and help us to see that you, you are for us, Lord, because when we are with you, Lord, we glorify you, we magnify your name, and we testify to the goodness of God. And so I thank you for everyone who's here, who's here in person, who's here online, who's watching this at some point in the future, Lord. I thank you for every single one of them, and I pray that every single one of them feels the encouragement of your spirit coming in and emboldening and empowering and ultimately bringing us closer in relationship to you. God, be with us. Be with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, so Pastor Dave is not here. Um, he is in California. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, we have a huge blessing uh, at our church, which is we have a wonderful body of preachers and elders who love to bring the word. And today is no different. We get to experience the teaching of our wonderful member of our shepherding team, Jim Black. So Jim, why don't you come on up here? Children's Church, you are dismissed. So if you want to head off to Children's Church, you can do so. Jim, I have had the opportunity to get to know you better and better over the past, past I don't know, five, six months or so mm -hmm. since this whole thing started. And I think that one of the things that I love about you is I walk away from every conversation we have being encouraged, mm -hmm. um, just feeling the joy of the Lord having overtaken you, and that blesses me. And so um, I'm going to pray over you really fast before you bring the word to the congregation that they could feel that as well. Yeah. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for... Brother Jim, Lord, and I just pray, God, that you would speak through him, that he would get out of the way, Lord, that it wouldn't be Jim's words, but it would be your words through him, Lord. And I pray that every person here would experience the blessing that is Jim Black, Lord. Um, help us to be encouraged and uplifted through his message today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Michael. I had breakfast with Michael recently, and... Uh, when we were parting company, I said, you know, Michael, the more I get to like, know you, the more I get to like you. And uh, I just really enjoy Michael and Naomi, and I think they are a grace gift to our congregation. Amen? Amen. All the people said, Amen! Amen. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> you know, I was sitting there behind uh, Michael and Naomi, and I was thinking... Uh, <laughs> I was thinking, Pastor Dave left this morning's service in the hands of us young people. <laughs> what craziness. And then I realized, oh, oh yeah, I'm 15 years older than he is. <laughs> <laughs> so us young people get to, get to play today. Anyway. <laughs> um, you're not going to be able to read all the scriptures that I have on the board, so I just encourage you to bust out your Bible, whether it's on your phone, on your tablet, or, the, uh, or, or a, a printed copy. There are those in the pew in front of you. Uh, feel free to, to open the scriptures. We're going we're gonna to be looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. 
because I want to talk to you this morning about one of my one of my favorite subjects in Scripture, and that is spiritual gifts. Uh, I want to talk to you very we are openly and frankly about spiritual gifts, and, uh, and we're going to have some some good dialogue. <laughs> well, not dialogue, monologue <laughs> about. The, the gifts, as Paul talks about this important subject here in Romans 12. You know, if, if you, if you want to study the spiritual gifts, uh, I encourage you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 as well, uh, because there are a lot of things that are explained there by, by Paul and when he's speaking to the Corinthian church, because they, they had some things going crazy in terms of spiritual gifts, so he straightens them out with some really good teaching. Now, if you go to the book of Acts and you try to develop theology of the gifts, you're going to have a tough time <laughs> because the Holy Spirit was doing all kinds of stuff in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts uh, was written by Dr. Luke, and he never intended to write uh, a, a, a thesis on what the Holy Spirit was, was going to do or should do or, or was going to do in the future, was doing now. He just explained what happened, okay? So if you try to develop a theology of the spiritual gifts from Acts, I have two words for you. Good luck. Uh, because it's going to be crazy. It's going to be hard for you to do that. Um, if you want to develop a theology of the gifts, then I encourage you to read Acts. Okay, see what God was doing. And then jump over to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and Romans 12, which we're going to talk about today. Then, because in those verses, Paul really helps us to develop a, a, a better theology of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church age with us, among us. So that's cool, isn't it? Never mind. Okay. Um, so... I was going through an airport recently. Uh, I, I fly a lot because I, uh, I oversee Africa for Converge, and so I, I wind up flying a lot, and I travel here domestically too. And uh, so I'm pretty comfortable in airports <laughs> and airplanes. Well, I'm not always comfortable in airplanes, but more airports. Um, but I was in an airport, and uh, I came up to a walking, uh, this moving walkway thing. You know what I'm talking about, the electric walkway thingy? And... Uh, I've been on them enough to know I, I have no problem with those things. No problem at all. But there was a lady there with too much luggage trying to get her three-year-old on the walk, on the walk, the, the moving walkway. And it was, I, my, my grandpa's heart went out to this lady and her little guy there. And I, I, I could not do any, I, I could not pass her up. I just couldn't. My grandpa heart just went into action, you know. And so I thought, uh, because you see, he, he was afraid to step on that walkway. It was scaring the daylights out of him. And yet, so the, the mom was trying to convince him to skip the walkway and just walk on the, you know, on the, on the, to the side. And he was having nothing to do with that. He was not going to do that. He was going to walk on that walkway. But it was scary, so he couldn't jump on it. But he was not going to walk the other way. We have a child who is just that way. And now we have a grandchild who's just that way. Rather opinionated, strongly opinionated. But this little guy was not going to jump on that thing. But he wanted to, but he couldn't. But he was definitely not going to walk the other way. So I had an, an idea. I thought, this lady is going to slap the tar out of me or she's going to enjoy this. I went up and I said, hey, little guy, let's hold hands and let's jump on there together. Is that cool? He said, yeah. I said, okay, one, two, three, ready, jump. And we jumped together onto that walking that, that walkway. And, and he was so happy. He was thrilled. I said, do you want to keep holding hands? And he said, yeah. I said, me too. We'll go together. He said, okay. So we got on that thing, and we were, you know, the wind was blowing in our face. <laughs> Hair was moving to the back. We were walking up that walkway. 
And we got to the end. I said, okay, here it comes, buddy. We're going to jump off together, okay? All right, I'm going to count to three, and you and I are going to jump. Ready? One, two, three. And we jumped, and he laughed. He said, that was so much fun. I said, it was fun, and you did it. You did it because we did it together. And that, was, that, wasn't, ter that wasn't terrifying, was it? He said, no, I could do it again. By myself. I said, I bet you could. And his mom was so <laughs> relieved, you know. She didn't slap me or anything. <laughs> I thought, you know, she's, she might be just a little bit afraid I'm going to run off with that little dude. No, 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 no. She was cool with it. Because what terrified him became a walkway of fun, of delight, of enjoyment. You might even say it was a walkway of grace. It was a gift. It was a gift to him. And it was a gift to me to have that opportunity to hold his hand and jump on there and hold hands the whole time and experience that together. Well, t Paul talks about being a channel of grace in this passage. Uh, being a channel of grace. Uh, and, and what that means in terms of allowing the spirit of the living God to work in us that which is good and perfect in his sight, which is a part of what God has done in you when you came to know grace, the grace of God. See, because when you came to know Christ, when the Spirit of the living God came into you, He gave you what everything, everything you need. Peter says, He gave you everything you need for life and godliness. He gave you everything you need for life and godliness, including spiritual gifts with which He has called us to serve. Okay? So, if you haven't already done so, open your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Did they already do it up there? Okay, cool. Now you've got it memorized. Cool, all right, let's press on. So, in this passage, Paul says, Paul starts off with thinking soberly about yourself. Do not think about yourself with egotism, and do not think about yourself in a denigrating way. Okay, you know what that word means, denigrating? It means blasting yourself, hurting yourself, doubting yourself, being mean at your, uh, toward yourself, you know, pushing yourself down, tearing yourself apart. So Paul says, think about yourself with, with sober judgment. Think about yourself with sober judgment. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> Sometimes we, we fail to do just that. We fail to think of ourselves with sober judgment. We can either uh, be, be arrogant or we can be self-denigrating, and neither of those two ends of the pendulum are healthy. Have you ever been around somebody who just thinks way too highly of themselves? <laughs> They're arrogant, you know. They think they've got it all together and they're going to share a little bit of their perfection with you. They're going to blast you with their perfection. Or somebody who, who just, you know, thinks of themselves as, as, as nothing. I'm just, I'm a worm. I'm nothing. I, I have nothing to give. I, I, I'm, I'm too broken. Uh, my, you, if you knew my past... If you knew my past, you wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't like me. If you knew the pain that I have had and, and caused others, you wouldn't like me. If you knew how bad I am, you wouldn't like me. I, I'm nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm here to tell you, if that's your view of self, Jesus loves you. He's for you. He's for you. And by the grace of God, he has taken you 
from distance from himself into closeness with himself. The Hebrew idea of that closeness is the word uh, elpanim, which means right up in God's face. Right in his face. And he, he, he shines his face on you. And, and that place, that place of being in the face of God, not, not, not negatively, you know, up in my face or up in my grill. No, 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 no. No, but, but before God's face. That's the place of his favor. That's the place of his forgiveness. That's the place of shalom. And shalom means a whole, mo a whole lot more than just peace. It means wholeness. It means wellness. It means goodness. It means you're hanging out in the, in the presence of God before his face. And his face, guess what? His face has a great big smile on it. Because you put your trust in Yeshua. Because you've come to that place where you rested in him. When you, where you have received his forgiveness. Where you have been cleansed. But where you've been made his child. You, you've been made his son. You've been made his daughter. And you've been filled with his spirit. And that is a place of the grace of God. So if you're running yourself down and counting yourself nothing, you didn't get that from God. You did not get that from the Word of God. So guess where it came from? It either came from you, from the world, or from Satan. Am I wrong? It either came from your negative thinking, or from the world trying to stamp you down, <laughs> or from the evil one who seeks to kill steal and destroy but jesus came to give us life and to give us give it more abundantly okay so think of yourself with sound judgment listen if anybody knew if anybody would experience negativity about themselves it was paul formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christians. He went about arresting Christians and getting them thrown in jail and seeing that some of them died. In fact, Saul of Tarsus, whom we know as Paul, was standing there minding the, the coats, the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen to death. And I think that reality he experienced burned a memory in his mind and heart that he may have just lived with the rest of his life. But in Paul's letters, which made their way into the New Testament, in Paul's letters, how does he introduce himself? He introduces himself as Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't you love that? Don't you love that celebration of his new identity? He's not Saul of Tarsus anymore. He's not Saul the persecutor. He's not Saul the angry man. He's Paul, the apostle. I have a book that was just given to me. The apostle. Paul, the apostle of the heart set free. A transformation, a transformation of the heart, transformation of the mind, transformation of the goal and the trajectory of a life. And Paul saw him that way, himself that way. How do you see yourself? When you think of yourself, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? A person who's bitter, angry, pushed down, made fun of? How do you see yourself? 
Paul says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Think of yourself on the basis of truth, not a lie. Secondly, he talks about thinking of yourself as part of the body of Christ. The next appeal is this, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of Members one <laughs> of another. We are members one of another. Paul's basing his appeal on the imagery of the human body, which has many parts or members. And those members of our human body do not all serve the same function or purpose. Each individual part, however, is still part of the body. In 1 Corinthians, Paul states it this way. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. <laughs> that would not make it any less a part of the body, would it? No. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That wouldn't not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the, the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. In both Corinthians and here, Paul, uh, in, in Romans, Paul's argument is that just like the diversity of the members of the parts of the human body is normal, and each part is intended to function in its own unique way, so in the body of Christ, each gifted person has his or her unique and important function. Just think for a minute about Cross Point Church, okay? Think about our church and all the people it takes to make the congregation move forward <laughs> as it should. We have musicians, greeters, leaders, cleaners, a treasurer, children's workers, ESL teachers, youth leaders, sound and video techs. Y'all are special. We love you. A church admin and Fred Homers. <laughs> and how you describe his role, I don't know. He's like a human Swiss Army knife. <laughs> but they're all important, aren't they? Can you say, well, well, one is not important, but the rest are. Well, which one's not important? <laughs> They're all important. Just like our body is important. Eight, year, eight years ago, about eight years ago, I think it was, I had surgery on my left foot. Well, to be more specific, I had surgery on my big toe of my left foot. Okay, to be more specific, I had surgery on the big knuckle of my big toe on my left foot. Not a big deal, right? It's just a toe. But you know what happened? You see, we have this thing called the central nervous system. And it didn't matter how much Tylenol I took. The central nervous system kept reporting to my brain that there's a whole bunch of pain down there. So I'd take more Tylenol. <laughs> that silly central nervous system kept working. Kept saying, pain, pain, pain. At the same time as I was trying to get over this surgery, there was a guy building a bathroom in my basement. And I wanted to be there to snoopervise. 
I, I felt like I needed to be there to tell him what to do. But I tried hobbling down those stairs with my crutches one time. And oh, my wife's laughing. And I, I could not manage that stair and crutches at the same time. I tried it, and I almost wound up doing a face plant at the bottom of the stairs. So I decided, well, I'm going to have to wait a while to supervise and just trust that he's doing, <clears throat> doing a good job. You know, because that toe may just be a big toe and might not seem all that important, but it's a part of the body. You know, minor, you know, you know what minor surgery is? Minor surgery is surgery done on somebody else, not me. <laughs> That's minor surgery. But that surgery on my big toe caused a lot of problems because the big toe is a part of the body and, part, and it's connected to the central nervous system. Right? Think of yourself as part of the body of Christ. Okay, we got to rush. We got to put it in, in high speed here. Lastly, think of yourself as a channel of grace. He says in verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Now, as we turn our attention to the grace gifts, we should pay attention to two things that the Apostle Paul points out right here in verse 6. These are those two things. Number one, the gifts are different from each other. They are not all the same. We'll come back to this later. Secondly, the gifts are the result of grace. The Greek word for spiritual gifts is one word, charismata, which comes from two words, meaning grace and to confer or, or give. If we put these two ideas together, we see that the charismata or spiritual gifts are grace conferred upon us for the purpose of extending grace to others around us. It's that they're given to us to give away. They're given to us so that we can be channels of grace. So the grace of God can come to us and transform us and give us these gifts and then we use those gifts, and in using those gifts, we are a blessing. God's grace flows through us. We become a channel of grace. Then the Apostle Paul writes about seven ministry gifts. I call them ministry gifts. Some people call them um, other things. But I, I like to refer, them as to refer to them as ministry gifts. And the gifts are these that he covers. He does not try and cover all of them, but he covers a sample of them. And um, they're very important, as all of them are. Okay, here we go. Ready? Number one, prophecy. And, pro and if prophecy is that, is that gift God has given you, use it in proportion to your faith, Paul says. In proportion to your faith. There's been a long debate whether the New Testament uses the word prophecy in the context of foretelling the future or forthtelling the will of God as revealed in the, word, in the written word of God. We see examples of both foretelling and forthtelling in the Old Testament and the New. For example, in um, Acts chapter 11, verses 27 28, it says this. Acts 11, 27, 28. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. That was clearly foretelling. Agabus was foretelling what was going to happen. There was going to be a famine and that famine, Luke tells us, that famine happened during the reign of Claudius. That was obviously foretelling. This was clearly, clearly foretelling. Okay, the high priest at the time of Jesus' 
unwitting, unwittingly prophesied that Jesus would die for others. Not his own sin, but this was obviously foretelling. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, is said to have prophesied in Luke, in Luke chapter 1. But then what is recorded is not so much a foretelling as a forth telling of what was written in the Old Testament that would be accomplished by the one who would make the way, make the path of Jesus. So he's saying basically, guess what? Those prophecies of the Old Testament, that's what's happened right now. That's forth telling, not foretelling. Are you getting that delineation? Are you getting the, cha the, the difference between those words? Forth foretelling is telling about something that is going to happen in the future. Forth telling is, is simply revealing what the will of God is. So there's a clear evidence in the New Testament that there are both outworkings of this gift. Paul makes it clear in this passage that this gift is to be exercised in proportion to faith. In other words, if the speaker does not have the faith to believe that what, they're, what, they're, what is burning in their soul is from God, they better just keep quiet. But if this person is convinced because of faith that this message burning in their soul is from God, then they better speak. And they better speak according to what Scripture says about the role of prophecy. Um, we have, okay, we've waded through some deep waters. Okay? And you may not be clear yet about this gift. Um, good. Talk to Pastor Michael about it later. He'll, <laughs> he'll fill you in and make it all clear for you. Because that's his role. Only not. But we've waded through some deep water. But the gift, this gift is important. This gift is important. And, and Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 4, too, and, and talks about the fact that the prophet, the evangelist, the, the apostle, the, the teacher, the, they're all gifts given to the body of Christ. So if we say, oh, that's not important. Okay, let me just say this before I move on. Here in North America, in, especially in evangelical churches, we, 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 we lift up the gift of the, the pastor teacher and we often put all those other gifts to the side. The prophet, the evangelist, nah, not so much. They belong in the parachurch world. They belong in crew or, 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 or some other organization, but not the church. And we make a big mistake when we do that. There are other roles that, that God has given for the church to be effectively using their giftedness. Okay, we've waded through some, hot, some deep water. Now we're going to wade through some less deep water. The gift of serving is one of the most misunderstood gifts in the church. The three ministry gifts of serving, teaching, and exhortation are presented in a similar way in this passage. In essence, what Paul was writing is that if your gift is serving, teaching, or exhortation, then minister in that given sphere. Don't downplay your gift and don't brag about it. Just use it knowing that it is what God by His Spirit has gifted you to do. Serving, giving, exhortation. Okay. So the gift of serving is a beautiful gift. It is a beautiful gift. And the person who does, who uses this gift is a marvelous gift to the body of Christ. Whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's cleaning, washing dishes, cleaning the floors, stacking chairs, helping to drive or get people from their vehicle to the church building or a thousand other ways to serve other people. They take great, this, the, 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 the person with this gift takes great joy in serving others. They don't do it grudgingly. They like it. I fear that some people who have this gift 
don't see themselves as having any gift. Because serving is not important, is it? <laughs> but God has given that gift of serving to many of us. And if we use it, we're a blessing to people around us. That gift of just being there for others and, and helping and, and cleaning and doing all these wonderful things. The gift of serving is it, it's, it's amazing. And it's beautiful. The gift of exhortation. Paul's list of gift, lists this gift of exhortation. This word very literally means to call someone alongside or, or to your side. Some Bible translations use the word encourage or encur encouragement for this gift. It is the gift of giving consolation or encouraging someone and strengthening them with your words. The person with this gift also sees others who are hurting or drifting from the truth. And they are motivated to come alongside them, these hurting people, to strengthen them and invite them into accountability. That's the exhortation gift. In addition, the exhorter is motivated to call those who are disobeying God back into obedience. Saying, no, 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 don't go that way. That's a sinful, that's a sinful path. <laughs> don't go there. Come back. That's an exhorter. The next three spiritual gifts listed come with some specific instructions or warnings. The three gifts are giving, leading, and mercy. And they come with warnings or they come with a little bit of, you know, uh, be careful about this. Okay. The gift of giving is a really interesting gift. Those who have the gift of giving are motivated not only to give money to worthy causes, but they often try to motivate others by doing, uh, providing what's called a matching gift. They'll say, for example, okay, here's a cause. I'm going to give $25,000 to this cause if you, the church, will match that twenty-five. dollars so what happens is my 25000 becomes 50000 You see, the person with giving loves to do that uh, because then they're motivated, they, they, they motiv they're motivated to see more giving happen. And so they encourage others to give. And the person with that gift really loves to see their resources applied to worthy causes. And they want to motivate others to give too. The instruction around this gift for the person who's gifted with this thing, this gift, is to do so with hilarity. Give generously. Give generously. I know of a church where there was a person who got a large inheritance, and they took the inheritance money and bought a grand piano for the church. What a wonderful gift. But this person did not want anyone to play the piano except herself, <laughs> one other person, uh, no, 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 two other people. So three people in the church were allowed to play the grand piano. The rest of the time, that one doesn't have a cover. Okay. The rest of the time, there was this lovely cover over it, and that cover stayed on it. So dust wouldn't get to it. Actually, it was so that little fingers didn't touch it. See, there was a gift, but there were strings attached. No pun intended. The pianos have a lot of strings. The, the instruction or, or, or caution around this gift is to do so with generosity. Give with no strings attached. If you're going to give, give. Give generously. Give with hilarity. <laughs> give. Say, well, just a minute, Jim. Is it 10%? Do I give a tithe or an offering? Duh, yes. You give generously. Give with hilarity. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, keep it secret. <laughs> and give with generosity. Okay. The gift of leading. This next gift, this gift, Paul states that those who lead must do so with zeal. 
why does he say with zeal? What's, what's the deal about that? Well, because um, the, the person with this gift is comfortable out front of the rest of the people. They're focused on the big picture, the future, and where we're going, the vision of what we're all about, and staying on course <laughs> to accomplish shared goals. The risk of the leader that the leader faces is leading out of personal strength rather than God's strength. Because oftentimes, leaders have sort of a charismatic personality. You know what I'm saying? They, they lead, and they're used to leading, and they're gifted to lead. So they stand out, and they, and, they, and they lead. But it's easy to slip back into that personality and lead from personality rather than lead from the power of the Spirit of God and to lead with, with zeal as God gives that person the, the, the gift to lead. And God has given some people the gift of leading. And it's a beautiful gift. We need that gift. <clears throat> but that person needs to lead with zeal and wisdom. They must zealously seek after God and His kingdom rather than pun uh, pu pushing their own agenda and relying on the strength of their personality or their giftedness. The leader must lead with humility and zeal, but zeal for God and His glory, not the leader's glory. The final gift mentioned in this text is the gift of mercy. The person with the gift of mercy is similar to the person gifted with exhortation, but the difference is that this person, the person with this gift, is enabled and prompted of God to empathize or sympathize with others in a very caring way. The person with this gift cares deeply about others and is motivated to journey with those others who are struggling with tough issues, such as grief, loneliness, addiction, physical or mental illness. These dear folks can walk with others on the long haul of recovery back to health and wholeness. That's the gift of mercy. What a lovely gift. What a gracious gift. We need those people. Those people who can identify pain and not run from it. But what is the caution? What caution does Paul give? He says those with mercy, those with the gift of mercy, should, should do so with joyfulness. See, the, 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 the downside, the dark side of the gift of mercy is that person, the gift of mercy sometimes gets sucked into the pain of other people. That person feels so deeply that they get drawn into that pain and they can become kind of sad and, 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 and difficult people, actually. And the other thing is, that, that they look at the rest, they, they can, if they walk in the flesh at all with this gift, they can look at the rest of us and say, all y'all are just messed up. Because like, unlike me, you're not merciful. See, that's why Paul warns that if that's your gift, do it with, with, with cheerfulness, with joy. Don't get bogged down in the pain of others around you. Be with them. Walk through that, those issues. Walk through the grief with them. Walk through the bitterness. Walk through the brokenness. Do so. Be alongside them. But don't let that drag you down. <laughs> Rather, pull them up and keep doing so with joy. Okay, so we've given you a sampler. Right? You remember those boxes, bo the box of chocolates called a sampler? We didn't give you every chocolate there is in the world. We just gave you a sampler. And that's what Paul did here. He gave a sampler of gifts and some cautions around some of those gifts. I want to ask you, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought, what is my gift or what are my gifts? You know, a, a carpenter has a whole box or, or, or bucket or, or belt, whatever, of tools. Not just one. 
I believe that God gives us primarily one or two motivational or ministry gifts, but God gives us a whole bunch of other gifts, which I call a gift mix. And that's not, it's not original with me, but it's a, it's a gift mix. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of things that God gives you. It may come and go at times, but you always are motivated by one or two primary motivational gifts. But you have a gift or gifts. You, every one of you, say, no, no, I'm too old. No, no, I'm too young. No, no, I'm too messed up. Listen, if Christ is in you and you are in Christ, you are a grace gift to the body of Christ. And God is working through you. And we need you. I'll say it again. We need you. Those of you online, listening online, we need you. We need your gifts. We need you to be a part of the body of Christ. We need that channel of grace that you are to us. So figure it out. And there are a lot of gift tests that you can do. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, Google it, you know, spiritual gift tests. There are a lot of them out there. And I've, I've done a lot of them over the years. But you know the best way I've discovered to, to discern your gifts? Get out there and do stuff. When I was a brand new baby believer, I heard that they needed a, a second grade Sunday school teacher. And I raised my hand. <laughs> And it took me about six weeks to realize that's not my gift <laughs> or my calling. <laughs> but then when I was 19 years old, I was a, I was a student in the, Bible, in the Bible school. And I came home for the summer, and my pastor said, Jim, you're leading Bible study Wednesday night. I'm doing, wah, wah, yeah, what? <laughs> you're leading Bible study Wednesday night. Well, there are a bunch of older folks uh, on that, in the Bible study on Wednesday night, including you know some retired missionaries and pastors uh, <coughs> and others. So you're leading Bible study on Wednesday night. Okay. So I dove into that. My first year in Bible college. They said, we're going to, we're going to the rescue mission Friday night. We're going to go do some street evangelism, and then we're going to go to the rescue mission. We're going to have a preacher, and we're going to have singers and stuff. And who wants to preach? My first year of Bible college, you know. Who wants to preach? Nobody raised their hands. So I said, I'll do it. And they said, okay, we'll have three guys preach then. <laughs> we don't know what this rookie's going to do, you know. You never know. Best way to discover what your gift is, is to do stuff. Just do stuff. And you'll figure it out. And when you, when you, start, when you start ministering in your area of giftedness, it's like, that eight-cylinder car that's firing well on all eight cylinders. <laughs> you know, you, you, you get joy, and others are blessed, and you enjoy it. You like it. A and others are blessed by that when you're functioning in your gifts. Now, does that mean if I'm a leader, if my gift, my primary motivational gift is leading, I can never serve? Rubbish. You can serve. You can do all kinds of things. Just know that the thing that's going to bring you the most joy and be the most blessing is for you to work in your area of giftedness. But I'm just concerned for some of y'all that maybe you are sitting on the sideline because you don't know what your gift is. You never figured it out. You never even thought about it. So you kind of sit on the sideline rather than getting involved. I'm asking you, I'm asking you, I'm imploring you, okay, I'm begging you, get off the couch, get serving with whatever you have, with that, whatever time you have, whatever energy you have, whatever, whatever, get off the couch and get serving, get moving, do something, and people are going to recognize, whoo, that person is functioning in their gifts. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. That person, we thought, we, we, we didn't know what their gifts are, but now they're doing stuff, 
and they, they love to serve. And so we're, we're giving them more responsibility to serve in different capacities. And you know what? They love it. They're, they're, they're firing on all eight cylinders. That's cool. But you've got to get doing stuff. It's the best way to discover your area of giftedness. Don't let, okay, I'm going to stop here. Don't let your brokenness keep you on the bench. Don't let your brokenness keep you on the bench. You need help. You need some mercy. <laughs> mercy there is great and grace is free. Multiply it to me. Come to the cross. Confess your need for mercy. Confess your need for help. Talk to somebody. Get the help you need. Mental illness, physical illness, whatever it is, get the help you need and get working, get serving. We're going to celebrate.